that we have estimated parameters in the model. I'll skip the estimation right now and just go to what do we do to analyze the residuals. So first of all, whenever you find something, and I think you also had the imp impression of that given what we've done so far, it's not uniquely defined which model is the true model. Even when I simulate data, if I do not simulate sufficiently many observations from that sequence, you will see that it's not clear which model is actually the model always. But we do need to kind of assess whether we're done or not done in the analysis. Also to get to the point, as I said earlier, we need to figure out which model is the least bad model. So how do we check that the residuals uh, or model errors resemble white noise? Well, I said that a couple of times before. You need to first plot the data. Is there power now? Oh, yes, he's light as well. Whoa. <laughs> okay, uh, that's great. So plot the data. Look at the autocorrelation function. You've probably done that already. But when looking at data, then you will look at various different things happening. So white noise or non-white noise. Here are just four examples. So what do we see here? We see an example where we have white noise, everything is smooth. We have one nice non-white noise where what we see is that the variance is increasing over time. We have one down here where it's asymmetric. This is a case where probably a log transform before doing the model would be appropriate. So if you have something where the residuals are very large to, to the positive side and not large to the negative side. That's a good indication, uh, indication of that large values have larger variance. And that's typically when you do a log transform. I can, I, I can also give you the explanation why it works, but I'll leave that for another day or after the lecture. And then you have the last one down here where everything looks nice except for one or two outliers. So what it do is different for each of these four cases. The first one is nice, but another way of looking at the assumption about white noise is that we need to assess, is this normally distributed or not? One way of doing that is to look at, say, histogram, and then just adding a curve on top that shows the theoretical expectation, given the mean value, which should be zero, and the observed standard deviation, that, that is just the density of the normal distribution. So when you look at these, well, the last two down here are clearly, there's something in tails that should not be there. But when you look at the two top ones, I would not be able to argue that one is better than the other based on the information that I have here. It's the same data as before. So this is definitely not normal, but you just don't see it here. If you look at the so-called QQ plot, quantile quantile plot, which I assume you've seen before, likewise for the two top ones, you cannot see the difference. Whereas for the two bottom ones, you can see that here there is some Skewness, very clear. And here, it's also clear that it actually looks like points on a straight line, except for two points that are outliers. So, but again, the top one, where you have the change in variant over time, you do not see that unless you plot it. Another way of looking at this, we're looking at something that has mean zero for the residuals. So if you have them and they are independent, the probability of a 
random variable to change sign. Every other time, it should change from being positive to negative if they are at random. So we can do a so-called sign test and say that there are n minus 1 possible changes in sign, and the, p value, the expectation is that half of those will be changes. So we can do, assume it's binomial distributed, n minus 1 outcomes with p 0.5. So how would that work? That should work fine. You can also say that n is typically large, and when p is equal to 0.5, is actually where the normal approximation for the binomial distribution is the best. So the expectation is n minus 1 divided by 2, and the variance is n minus 1 divided by 4, because you multiply by p and 1 minus p, which is also a half. So this is just looking at how it should look like for the binomial distribution and the normal distribution when you have a binomial of 100 and the p-values being 0.5. These are the both theoretical distribution. You can see there's a slight change out here, but it's very, very small. And the larger n gets, the smaller the difference. So for practical purposes, it's fine to use either. The benefit of doing the normal thing is that you can actually do it in your head. But if you're sitting in front of a computer, well, you might as well just look, use the binomial distribution. So for the data we have here, we have 100 white noise residuals, and the confidence interval then becomes between 40 and 59. So if we have, in this case, 47 changes in sign, which means that we cannot reject that the p, the probability of changing sign is 50%. We could also do it in other ways. What we will see sometimes when it's not inside the interval, well, if there are too few, it could indicate there's a positive correlation left. So if you are above, you will be above for a period of time. If you are below, you'll be below for a period of time. Likewise, if there are too many, you could have a negative correlation. So you will be jumping up and down too frequent, indicating that there's something more to do. You can say you would also see that if you do the autocorrelation function. And well, you can also have a lot of other things that is the reason why um, this happens. Another thing that you should consider, which is also done for you, I'll show you later how it's done automatically for you, is if you have white noise, we discussed over here that when you look at some autocorrelation function, we have this confidence interval out here. If we have just white noise, let's do some autocorrelation function or some white noise, say 100 observations, what do we have? Well, our expectations of all the values out here, except for like zero, is zero, right? And we discussed earlier that the variance is 1 over n. So each of them, each of the correlation has expectation zero and variance 1 over n. And if we take the sum of squared of those, it's chi-squared distributed. So from a theoretical point of view, you have this expectation, you have this uh, test size, and you compare it with a chi-squared distribution. If you just have some white noise, you want to test if it is white noise. In practice, it's a little bit different because we will have a model that we estimated first. So we have these errors here comes from a model that we estimated. 1 over n is still a limit for the variance, but we have less degrees of freedom. So it's not 
chi-square with m degrees of freedom, but with m minus n, where n is the number of parameters that we estimated. I think that makes somewhat sense. Um, so this is for if you have no model at all, but if you have a model, you have to subtract the degrees of freedom that you used for the model. Of course, this is under the assumption of things being white noise in the residuals, which is what we want it to be. So can we reject this? This is basically looking at not just one of these, but a sequence of the autocorrelation functions. Are they in, combine, in combination? Is there any dependence? So first of all, look at the residuals, just plotting them. Test, of course, the autocorrelation function, just calculate it, looking at it. We've done that many times today. Um, also, looking at the chi-square test for the sum of squared auto sample autocorrelation function. And a lot of this you can get from the function called TSDIAC. I'll just run it um, on some data here. Now I changed the data, but let me just do it for, for one. Ah, this was the simul. I should do this for a model instead of... Okay, so I'll, I'll do that when I've fitted a model at a later point in time. Um, it also says here, I just didn't read what it says, TSDIAC uses an output from an ARIMA model. A ARIMA model is, you can say, the topic for how to estimate parameters. It's a function where you specify, this is the model I want, give me a fit, and then you could do some diagnosis on that. We could easily do it for this particular model. We could do an ARIMA oops, model, not knowing exactly what it does. But what we have to specify is first we specify the data that we use, SIM2, and then we specify the order. And let me just specify this one to be an ARMA, an AR1 model like this. And we don't have to consider the rest right now. And then get a very nice plot here. Hopefully a little bit nicer if we zoom out. So what we see here is that we have a plot of the residuals. We have the autocorrelation function where nothing sticks out. And then we have the so-called young buck test statistic, or test down here, which is the test for autocorrelation. So here, nothing is significant here. Had I used a different model than the one that is the appropriate model, let me just use a model that is just assuming that the data is white noise. Then what you will see is that there is an autocorrelation function here that is significant. Likewise, you see that even looking at just the first lag, there is significant correlation. But I will discuss this more later, but not today. Yes? I, so what I did, okay, let me say it a little bit slower. I fitted a model assuming white noise. I could fit a model where I assume it a moving average model of order one to do something different. So I, it's kind of tedious to fit a model that is no model, but it means that I get an object out that has the right structure so that I can show the diagnostic plot. That was my purpose. I know it's a little bit. And, and what kind of data was sim to? What was that actually generated from? It's an AR. It's a pure AR1 model. Okay. I could also take the sim one from up here, but the reason why I didn't do it was because during the break I changed it a little bit. 
So now I have an Arima 1.1 model up there. If I use that, let me let me just do it and assume that it's an AR1 model at first. Then it tells me I have a problem because it's actually starting with, but that gets down to the method that I will cover later. It's a conditional sum of square that it does initially, and it gets a non-stationary non estimate. Well, we know that the data is non-stationary, so it's not a surprise. I could force it to use method. But now if I show you the estimate, this is one of the cases that I mentioned earlier. I'm fitting an AR1 model, and if you look at the estimate there, 0 0.9986. It's not so different from one, right? And the uncertainty, it's one standard error away from one. So this is one of the places where it would be appropriate to not have an AR1 model, but to try to fit a model that's just differencing. And if I then do the TS diag of this, let me get the right zoom level here. You can see a nice AR1 pattern here. So the next thing to do would be to fit an AR1, an ARI 1,1 model. Now I fitted the param parameter here, 0 0.63, quite close to the 0 0.6 that I actually used. And if I look at the diagnostic plot of the residuals, now again I see the autocorrelation function does nothing, and there's no structure in the higher, in the combination of the autocorrelations that should be dealt with as well. That was a little bit of a sidestep, or you can say a teaser for what comes later, but not today. So, you can also do the sign test. And one thing that I have not shown right now is the so-called scale cumulative periodogram, where you look at the frequency information in the data. But in this version of the course, I kind of skip most of the frequency-related stuff. Um, so I'll just show you how it works but I will not go through the theory for it. Um, but what you do, and maybe I should just do it for the data we just looked at before. Gives the time series here. So we should have the residuals from the model. So I can take A1, dollar residuals, and I get something like this. So consider these frequencies, and if the black line is inside the two uh, dashed blue lines, everything is fine. If I instead take the original data, SIM1, and do it for that. Can you see what happens? The black line, you can see it just in the corner there. At first I thought it was an error, but it's not an error. It's just so far away from what it should be. It's not often that it's that far away, I would say. If you try to do something meaningful, it should not look like this. But of course, I did not try to do anything meaningful right now. I just tried to stress it. But you can also read about it in the book. It's documented there, what comes behind it. So what is that we need to do? We need to consider how to extend or reduce the model as well. I've just done it right now as examples where I said we need to add something to get an adequate model. So that was what we did down here. We said we, we first fit some model and then we expand the model somehow. But we can also make a model too big. So what is the next thing we should consider?
we should test whether our model is actually appropriate. What do we do? Well, we could test whether the parameters that we estimate are actually significant. So that's the next thing we can do. We discussed, sorry, what is written here is kind of figuring out what is left for another structure. But whenever you increase the model, the size of the model, what happens to the sum of square residuals? Initially, when you make a model and you include a parameter, whenever you inc increase the size of the model, you will reduce the sum of squared, squared residuals. And actually, as long as you have more observations, the more parameters that you add, the lower the sum of squared residuals. But as you probably know from another statistics course, at some point you're fitting the noise. You have to find out which model is the most appropriate. Assuming models are nested, and I'll get back to that. Do you know the concept of nested models? Anyone not knowing that? Sort of expected. <laughs> so, but I'll get back to that in a moment. So we want to do testing. And I assume you've all done these tests before. In an introductory statistics course, just things are a little bit different here, but it's not, I mean, the idea of the test is exactly the same. So if you have a model and you want to test, you have some parameters and you want to test if some of these, one or more, could be assumed to be zero. It's just like when you do an ANOVA test. You look at the sum of squared, look at the change in sum of squared residuals, normalize with how many parameters are different, and then you look at, for the simple model, how is the distribution of the errors from that? What is the estimate of sigma effectively? Which follows an F distribution with the number of parameters that are different and comma, the number of observations minus the number of our parameters in model two. So it's the totally the standard setup for doing an F test. You just need to look at the sum of squared residuals from two models and then you can compare them. You can also use a likelihood ratio test and when assuming things are normally distributed, they coincide, so you will get the same. So, that's one test to do. But typically, if you do linear regression, often what you do is you test one parameter at a time, right? So you look at the one parameter that, has the least, that is the least significant. And what you do there is to use a t-distribution. The same thing here. So it's the same setup. You look at the estimate. You divide it by the standard deviation, and you look at how large is that. Is that a factor that is greater than approximately 2? Then it's significant. If it is less than 2, it's probably not significant. So that's the usual approach. The one thing that is different is that you have to keep in mind how many parameters do you have in your model. How many parameters have you estimated? Typically, you have a P and a Q for an armor model. Sometimes you also estimate a mean value, so you have to subtract one more. But it's just the number of parameters that you estimated, excluding sigma, which is kind of derived from that. And you can say often n is sufficiently large that it doesn't matter so much, and the normal approximation is appropriate. But as a rule of thumb, a factor of two is not too bad. If you can do it, let's go back to R here. I had my model here, A1. Oops. I can see my estimate here, and I can see the corresponding 
standard error of that estimate. So if I divide my estimate 0.63 with my standard error 0 0.06, 0 0.03, it's definitely much greater than 2, right? If I instead estimated a non-appropriate model, I'll just estimate an AR4, uh, ARIMA 4,1 model, just to do something. Then you will see that many of these parameters, actually all but the first one, there the standard error is actually greater than the estimate. So of course we should reduce this model. So that's how we're going to do things. So the quick and easy thing is to just look at the model output and see which, ones, which one of the parameters is the least significant and consider that. But if you have an, another model structure, I'll do something. So you have an ARIMA 2,1,1 model. Then you can see that the moving average model here has a very large uncertainty. Everything, actually most things here just fails, right? Nothing is significant right now. So you have to pick where to start. You cannot remove, you can only remove the highest order, AR or MA term. You cannot remove, you can say any term. You can only take it from the highest order and peel off. But I'll show you more examples in the next lecture. So that is how to test for one parameter. This is what it typically will do. This is what you are expected to do. Now, I mentioned models being nested. What does it mean that a model is nested? Some of you knew, but it means that a model is nested if you can go from one model to another model by setting some parameters to zero. So if we take an, say an ARMA 2,1 model like this, I'll make it a 3,1 to give me a little bit more freedom. So this is the reference model. And then I will write a few models below here. I can have an, a model ARMA 2,1. Is this one nested within the ARMA 3,1? You can. You can take the AR, the phi tree parameter, set that to zero, and you are the ARMA 2,1 model. So this model up here has uh, a structure yt plus phi 1 yt minus 1 plus phi 2 yt minus 2 plus phi 3 yt minus 3 equals to theta. Ah, yeah. Let me write epsilon t plus theta. 1 epsilon t minus 1. So if I set this one to 0, oh, right, I have an ARMA 2,1 model. Yeah, I was thinking of just you know, the 3 or the 1 to 0, of course, that's not it. Yes, so it's the parameter inside the model. Can I, here I have four parameters in this model. If I set some of those to 0, I can also write an AR2 model. Is that nested within? Yes, I see someone nodding up there. <laughs> so a lot of models here, but how about, now I have this one as my reference model. And then I look at an ARMA 
1 comma 1 model which of the it's nested within this one right it's nested within this model but it's not nested within that model because i'm adding a new parameter while also removing one parameter and they're neither nested in the other order but mo both models are nested within the ARMA 2,1 model. So that's the one, that's the kind of thing to keep in mind when you're going to compare models. There are some models that we can compare and some that we cannot compare. Brings us back to the example that we had earlier. We could not say that it was an AR2, an ARMA 1,1, or a moving average 2 model. By the way, this model is not nested within any of the above. So what do we do? We want to compare them anyhow. Sometimes you do actually want to compare them. I don't know, do you know the answer? Or? So I could, I could have an even bigger, bigger model it's called the supermodel. And then you can contest that one compared to that one. But what you actually want to do, you know that one is a bad model. But you don't know which one of these models is the better model. So you cannot test between these models. You can only test relative to something that is larger. Of course, you can see when you look at this model, which of the models where do you get the best performance by removing one parameter? But often you end up, say, from doing different model approaches with some models down here, and you'll maybe not be able to fit that model because of structure in the data. So one solution is to use so-called information criteria. I assume that many of you have heard about the Akaigis information criteria, or just AIC. Anyone not heard of that? Quite some. OK. Um, so we've done the testing. The formal testing you can do when you have things that are nested. But often you run into a case where things are not nested. Like your ratio tests, which I have not covered, but it's quite in parallel to this, to the testing, you also need things to be nested. So we have what's called the information criteria which you calculate by taking minus 2 times the logarithm of the likelihood plus. So this gives you something where the better the model, the likelihood here increases, right? You do maximum likelihood, take a log of that, still maximization, and then you minimize. But so you, the better, the larger the model you get, so we looked at earlier, then you, the sum of squared residuals becomes smaller. That means that the likelihood would also always somewhat increase. But the question is, does it increase sufficiently to compensate for the extra parameter? Therefore, there's a penalty of two times the number of parameters. It also means that if you are comparing, in this case over here, three models with the same number of parameters, you're actually just looking at which one has the highest likelihood. That is, minimizing the information criteria corresponds to finding the highest likelihood. And then, of course, if there is a difference in the number of parameters, say you want to compare the MA2 model with the ARMA 3,1 model, you have two parameters difference, then the increase has to be better than two times the difference in number of parameters. Now, the Akaigis information criteria, or just AIC, does not scale that much with the number of uh, observations you have in it. So another criteria is the so-called Bayesian information criteria, where rather than a factor of two, you use the log of the number of observations. And you do the same thing if you have kind of a typical regression models. So this here 
means that the penalty for adding a parameter increases with the more observations that you have. In practice, the Bayesian information criteria gets you quite close to what you have if you do the formal testing on nested models. So it actually works well. The AIC will tend to give you a model that is slightly larger because 2 and log n, n does not have to be that large before log n is greater than 2, right? So the penalty per parameter is generally smaller for the Akagis information criteria than it is for the Bayesian information criteria. So in practice, except for an additive constant, we can look at the n times the logarithm of the estimate of sigma square plus two times the parameters for the AIC and the BSC n times the log of the sigma epsilon square plus the log n of the number of parameters. So that's what we're comparing. Yes? We are minimizing. No, 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 no. We want to find the one that has the lowest value. So say for a particular data set, I estimated all of these models. Someone is it, someone not. Who cares? I just picked the one that has the lowest AIC, pretty much. So that is one approach to modeling. I don't care too much about statistics. I just want to fit a model that has the best information criteria. Um, I would say you should also look at procedures and other things, but that is what you want to do. And it's another way of phrasing that independent of n, base information criteria gives a consistent estimate of the model order, whereas the Archives information criteria will tend to have a larger model when n becomes large. Larger than what you should get. So today we covered how to estimate the autocorrelation function. We looked at, and I kept it here for quite a while, a table saying how to pick the right model, if it is an armor model. Also, we discussed how to actually do this in practice by starting with, well, I definitely need this kind of model, and then you can kind of add on stepwise. We also looked at several methods for doing residual analysis. You don't have to do all, but you just have to convince. So you have to test for the manager, you have to test for also correlation. That's the least that you can do. And Whenever things are not nested, you can use information criteria. That is, next slide is just which exercises are for today. So that is what I had for the program for today. What I want to do for next week is to make a screencast, sort of like the one I did a week ago in the evening, because I realized that the video recording was not working. Um, A, because I won't be here on Friday. I have someone who can be here if needed, uh, besides the TAs. But the next part is on estimating how to estimate, as in what happens when I run the uh, ARIMA function in R, what is actually behind the scene there. I will not be asking you to implement that yourself, but it's important that you know what is going on to be able to understand the errors that occur. May occur, but often will occur. Um, so so I, will, I think it's sufficient to just do it as a webcast. What is important for you to spend some time on is when you look at autocorrelation functions and partial autocorrelation functions and data to figure out which model is the appropriate model. So I plan to make a quiz set up where you can try a number of those similar to the ones we did here today, but just so that you get to see some more, because that's the important part, to be able to pick out the right one. What I've 
typically seen is that students, when they look at a long exponential tail, they'll say, I need an AR7 model, even though it was actually just an AR1 model that was behind. So they can often be misused. So I'll try to make a good handful of more examples, some easy, some not so easy, um, just for you to get some experience. So that's, that's the plan for next week. The TAs will come at 10 o'clock. It also means that I've been considering when to kind of close assignment two. Should it be Thursday night or should it be Friday morning? If you have any preference, please say it now. Or it could also be in week 42 sometime. I offered that earlier on. Um, it's not a problem for me. But I prefer not to do it in the autumn break to give you some time off. Yes, Friday morning is good for everyone. Then that's the way it will be. I have looked at the peer grading. And this down here is, you can say, the summary of your scores. They are sort of as expected. There's a lot of you who are, you can say, in the interval in the 60s somewhere. And I also said in a, I did not expect anyone to be getting 100% because they need to be above expectations many places to get up there, to get above 90%. So you can say the good ones are uh, three students that are above 80% in the peer grading. There are still a few, six, that have not done their peer grading yet or not done doing it. Um, so I think I will open peer grading and give those persons a chance to get it done today. So far, I've looked at a small handful of your hand-ins because I've looked at where are the differences between the different, when you peer grade, multiple peer, persons peer grade the same assignment, there are differences. Um, it's particular for two questions that are differences. So I've looked into that. And for a couple of you, I will add my own assessment besides the ones that you've done, uh, but I'll only do those places where I find that it's needed. Um, but I've looked at more than the ones where I'm actually going to do things. Um, so, and that's particularly one where some figures were not including in what was uploaded where I have access to the figure because they were uploaded in CampusNet. And I think there it's fair that I assess what is in CampusNet and make that count. Um, but for the rest of you, I think, at least from my perspective, it looks fine. I don't know, what is your experience? So far good? Sorry? I mean, the assignments, they've been great. Yes. Yes, thank you. Others? Yes? Yes. I, I did not add that, but I mean, easily add that just because you have the option to add comments everywhere. Um, so, but it will be fine to say final remarks. Uh, a couple of you, uh, at least one of you wrote, it's inappropriate that I assess this other one because I know whom that other person is. Um, I think. And when I look at the result that was given there, it was sort of almost identical to the other person's grading that one. So I don't see that as a problem, but it's good that you just notify me that it happens. But that will happen at random, but that's also why that there are multiple people assessing each one. So I don't see that as a challenge, but it's good that you flag it. 
And I've looked at those few cases that are there um, when things are not as it should be. Yes? Can we see our own percentage? Can, uh, if you can see it? Yes. Yes, I think you can. I actually don't know because I haven't been trying to log in as you. Um, maybe you can only do that when well, peering. You should be able to check it now because. Yeah, I can see the peer rating. I can see all three graders, but I can get like a numerical score. I kind of get the score. Ah, OK. Um, I will think of that. Would it be great for you to have an email saying, this is your score, not too much else? Because I think I could make a script that does that. <laughs> that, that, that that'll be fine to do that. Also because you can say, I gave higher weight to some of the questions than to other questions. But before doing that, I would like to spend a few days also looking into things. So expect that to come ne next, sometime next week. Um, no problem in disclosing that. Other questions, comments? Yes? You have the option to flag if you find that someone assessed you wrong, then you should flag it. Because then I will get notified. So far, there's been no flags. I've been checking. Well, last time I checked was last night. Uh, so far, there's no flags. So please go in and check if there's some places where you really disagree. I've noticed a few cases where you can say, I would not flag that because there's a few places where that I, of the places I've seen where one of the assessors had been a little bit too gentle relative to what I would have done. But it's only, you could say, so little that it will not change the grade in the end. So I, I'm, really, I, I'm fairly confident that, what, uh, that you generally did a good job. Okay. Good. <laughs>